experts in pharmacoepidemiology and pharmacovigilance uh, in maternal and pediatric health who are going to provide feedback on the proposed pregnancy safety study framework, along with um, two representatives from FDA who will uh, be able to respond and, and expand on the feedback. And if you're like me and your postprandial short-term memory is not the best, I'm going to introduce each panelist right before they uh, give their presentation rather than all at once. So we'll dive right in and start with Marie Thiel, who's the global head of Women of Childbearing Age program at UCB Biopharma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hand it? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion. And I want to say I've uh, dedicated more than 10 years in pharma working on trying to close the data gap for women of child being age with chronic diseases. We're well, mostly in chronic diseases, so women who do not necessarily uh, say have a disease of pregnancy, actually, but may have uh, uncontrolled disease during their pregnancies. So we've been trying, like industry has been trying to do it all. We do pharmacovigilance. We look at enhanced pharmacovigilance. We try, especially in pregnancy, to look very, very carefully at cases. We have teratologists coming, reviewing these cases. We do prospective registry studies. We do claims database. We even went to do clinical trials, like PK in pregnancy and placental transfer and milk transfer. So a whole scope of studies that I think um, are very important for women, and we heard that from Myra yesterday, and we hear that all the time. So I really applaud the commitment of the agency for this work. I, I know there's a tremendous amount of work behind it. It's really great to see that, and we're looking forward to having a framework that we can use uh, consistently and transparently um, for all our PMRs. So as we're discussing this framework, uh, there are a couple of key considerations that I would like to highlight. And the first one, so first of all, the privilege of coming at the end of the two days is that I don't think I have anything new to tell you, but what I'm going to do is try to summarize that. Uh, or at least the key points that for industry uh, are, are really important to consider in the framework. Uh, the first one is the risk. How do we define risk for these uh, people, pregnant women, who um, you know, have very various threshold and various diseases? So we talk about major congenital malformation. We talk about teratologic effect of a drug, absolutely. This is super important. But then we need to think about the risk to the child of uh, a mother having uncontrolled disease during pregnancy. And it has been said yesterday, it has been said again and again, but I think it's really crucial that we think about how do we integrate in this framework this risk of the fetus or to the fetus of having a mother with uncontrolled disease. And it can be huge. So especially in certain diseases. So I think we really need to think about it and how we do that. The second point is about sample size, not surprisingly. Um, sample size is a challenge for all of us, I think, and we heard that again. And when we talk about magnitude of exposure, of course, the size of the population of interest is important. But we need to think when we talk about percentage of exposure, is that of something that has been happening again and again practically and that we hear from physicians, is that women would stop their treatment at positive pregnancy tests, especially for unplanned pregnancy. But unfortunately, still now in plan, but definitely for unplanned. So how do we so the fact is, we're not going to have huge sample size. It takes years. We saw the Sentinel data. We saw that. So how are we integrating this small sample size in signal detection and in signal evaluation for, for this particular framework? And how are we interpreting this data? Because the interpretation is actually what matters to patients and physicians. And lastly, um, 
very much in the same vein is because the data are sparse, it's not one study with one data source that is going to help us. We need various data sources. All these studies are complementary or could be complementary. And I think we need to consider with this framework addressing multiple data sets and really looking at what we have available today. Leila, you talked about pharmacovigilance data um, yesterday. Yes, there is a lot of data in pharmacovigilance database, and we do enhance pharmacovigilance. So how can these data be used to enrich the data pool for this study? How can we use data from clinical trials? We have some data. They are not large, because we still exclude pregnant women from our studies. But we have some data. And we tend now to actually do protocol where we continue following these women during pregnancy um, after once if they get pregnant during the clinical trial. So let's think about pulling all these data together. Sometimes there are PK data that are available. Shouldn't we include them in the framework and get a better sense of the context for these patients? So that's pretty much my three points. I have a lot more I could share, maybe during the discussion, but at least as a start. And I want to leave some space for, for everyone. Um, so again, thank you. I think we need to keep in mind why we're doing that. We're doing that for the patients, for the physicians that need to have this discussion. And so we need to inform them with the right information at the right time. And I would argue the right time is yesterday almost. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, let's think that way. And uh, I think by having this forum, we are already making huge progress in that direction. So thank you. Thank you, Marie. Next, we have Sonia Hernandez-Diaz, who's a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where she serves as director of the Pharma Lab Epidemiology and Real World Evidence Program. Sonia? Yeah, thank you. I, I would like to thank the FDA for creating this forum of collaboration. Um, and also I applaud uh, the consistent systematic framework that is being proposed while being flexible and, and dynamic and, and having the demonstration projects to kind of pilot test it. Um, so I would like to give a, a little history from my perspective. Um, around 20 plus years ago, uh, Dr. Alan Mitchell and others that are here in the audience, Leila, Tina was here yesterday, Sarah Efros, they um, proposed a framework, a, a proactive surveillance that will include all the different sources of data, including first the registries proposed as the first line of defense against thalidomides that will um, enroll 50, 500 exposed pregnancies as soon as possible after approval, and they, they will detect major teratogens. That was the, the goal. And knowing that it is kind of impossible to power a pregnancy registry to identify small effects on specific malformations that happen in one in a thousand, one in 10,000 births. And another advantage of the registries is the quality of data, having direct patient information on whether the person took the medication, uh, also on outcomes and the quality and the range of outcomes that one can um, obtain from direct patient or direct to clinician information. But then um, the uh, surveillance proposal included the databases that will identify more moderate teratogens or you can also consider effects on other outcomes. Um, and that as data accumulated, they were going to narrow the boundaries around the risk. So the intention was not to test safe or not, but to narrow what we know so that we can rule out a, a strong uh, risks. And then uh, it was also proposed that if a, a signal is identified, uh, other designs like case control studies could follow up um, and, and look at the associations with specific birth defects. Um, so that was 20 years ago. I think some things have changed now uh, in the sense that the timing of when to identify the signals is not that clearly different between the registries and the current databases that, as we heard this morning, had huge sample sizes, and uh, some of them have timely uh, uh, access to the data. So the investigators in the past 
had to wait for the pregnancies to be exposed. For most outcomes, you know, nine or so months for you to observe the outcomes, and that, that's only perinatal outcomes. And then if the data was recorded in administrative records, the investigators had to wait say, three years to have access. Now for some databases, that data lag time is kind of six months. Uh, so the benefits in time um, between registries and databases is no longer one of the major differences. However, the difference in quality and outcomes remain. So I think when comparing the two sources, um, I will focus on, on that aspect um, mostly. Um, having said that, the small numbers is a, is a challenge for everybody. Uh, we saw yesterday uh, that around 60% of PMRs are not completed because they cannot enroll in uh, sufficient numbers. And of those completed, we have the information two to 14 years later. So if there are no exposed pregnancies out there, neither registries nor databases can find exposed pregnancies. And if they are exposed pregnancies, we cannot wait 14 years. So I think that's where this framework is going to, to help operationalize in a systematic way. And because of that, I will like to start by giving two recommendations and then we will have plenty of time to discuss them. Um, one, uh, I will recommend to the framework for it to include internal dynamic rules that allow for um, an adaptive design uh, a priori of what you would you do if you find this or if you don't find that, if you accumulate the example of exposed or not. And another recommendation would be for the demonstrations, uh, demonstration projects to be realistic and um, use either examples from the literature or from uh, the PMR to use examples that are more connected with reality because except for uh, things like the vaccines in the pandemic, we do not have 1,000 to 10,000 exposed. We have more like 10 to 500 in that range. Um, so that's uh, my initial recommendation and I'm um, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Sara. <laughs> Sonia, next we have Krista Hoybrooks, who's an associate professor of medicine and epidemiology at Harvard Medical School and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and adjunct associate professor at Boston University School of Public Health. She is co-founder and co-director of the Harvard Program on Perinatal and Pediatric, Pediatric Pharmacoepidemiology. Krista. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to join this panel today. Um, as my colleagues have done, I will share some reflections on um, the draft framework based on a review of the framework and then also informed by the discussions and questions um, of, of the past day and a half. I will shift a little bit more to the specifics on the framework itself. Um, and I'd like to start by um, joining again my colleagues in thanking the FDA team for um, basically the, the thoroughness uh, with which they're sort of um, approaching what is a really challenging um, question, um, but a desperately, one that is in desperate need, desperate need for an answer. Um, so first, as has been mentioned a number of times during this workshop, um, I believe it's really important that we keep in mind that as a guiding principle that none of these studies is perfect. Each has its advantages and disadvantages, um, and as Sonia mentioned, each was initially conceived of with a different purpose in mind. So in that sense, I really don't see them as alternatives to each other, but more as complementary approaches when trying to answer questions about drug safety in pregnancy. And I think each of them can really shed a different light on the question that we have. Secondly, um, there's been quite some discussion about the limitations of some of these approaches in the context of like, um, misclassification of exposure, misclassification of the outcome, and, and confounding. Um, and it has sort of, or the implications in terms of study size have, have sort of been highlighted. Um, but that's what this sort of suggests is that the, the size of the study, um, or what it suggests is that um, it, it's sort of a framework of statistical significance testing, because no matter how large your study is, if you have a systematic bias, that bias is going to be there, and your point of it is going to be off. And I'm not convinced that we really want to go towards statistical significance testing, but the goal is really to get like as good an estimate as possible of the magnitude of the effect and the uncertainty that we have around that effect. So we're very interested in like what is that upper limit of that 95% confidence interval because that will allow us to rule out 
like strong teratogens. So rather than really focusing on this, this study size and therefore on the statistical significance, one component that I think is really important is to think about other tools that we have available. It was mentioned this morning as well. We do have quantitative bias analyses that allow us to sort of assess what the potential impact on that point estimate, on that confidence interval is of potential um, systematic errors, regardless of which approach that we're using. Then in the current draft framework, there's sort of two important driving factors. So one is the minimum required sample size, and the other one is the number of expected exposed pregnancies. Um, but I believe that these characteristics are really not fixed for a given drug, but are sort of a characteristic of like the drug outcome diet that it is that we're studying. And, and I just want to sort of explain a little bit what I mean here is like, as we all know, like the minimum required sample size is not only driven by the relative risk or the risk difference, but by the prevalence of the outcome. And most of the studies we're going to be doing are going to be looking at a whole range of different outcomes. So in that sense, like it's, it's a little bit of a hard concept to sort of wrap your head around. It's like what will be the minimum required outcome for minimum required sample size for a given drug. And then related to that, depending on the outcome we're studying, the etiologically relevant time window will be different. So again, when thinking about what is the number of exposed pregnancies, well, it will depend on the outcome because it depends <coughs> on the etiologically relevant time window. So for those two reasons, I'm really not sure when we're trying to answer the question, like what is the expected study size um, and um, that we need, that it's really a characteristic of the drug, but it's really that drug outcome association. Closely related to that, like another um, driving factor in the framework is the, the outcomes of interest. And it's been mentioned a number of times, like we don't know based on randomized control trials um, what the signals are. We know that animal studies don't really translate well to human um, uh, situations. And then drug structure and, and function um, don't really give us a lot of information. So. Although sometimes based on the preclinical data, we might have some concerns and like some signal that we want to evaluate further. I think in most cases, I wonder, don't we really want to evaluate a whole range of potential outcomes? So again, I think in most situations at the time of drug approval, you're really faced with a situation that you're interested in evaluating this whole range of potential outcomes. Then coming back to the validity considerations, I think we have learned a lot in the last decade or so in terms of the importance of confounding, um, especially confounding by the underlying indication and the factors associated with it. And um, we know that different data sources have those sort of different strengths and weaknesses in terms of the types of information, uh, confounding information that they have available. But one thing, and that sort of goes back to the comment that has been made a couple of times, is like we're dealing with a very limited sample size in the first couple of years. So regardless of like how rich the confounding information is that we might have available, in those first couple of years, I think we sort of have to accept that there's only so much we can do in terms of um, adjusting for confounding. We really need large numbers in order to be able to take advantage of those rich information that we have available. And that brings me sort of to the last point that I wanted to touch upon in my opening remarks. Um, I think of a formal decision tree type framework, such as the one that we've been discussing here, is incredibly useful. Um, one point that I wanted to make is it seems like we're really focusing this whole process on trying to identify what the optimal study is. And I'm wondering whether that is really a question that has an answer, like is there really one optimal study or should we really take advantage of the different types of study approaches? Um, and one component that sort of seems to be missing in that process is like some, and, and I think Sonia was referring to that, some pre-specified decision points. Like it, it's a dynamic process and early on when we're gonna have very few pregnancies, the best we're gonna be able to do is sort of monitor use start describing what we sort of see happening in these pregnancies, whether it's based on a registry, whether it's based on a database. It would be really important then to get some consensus as to how many exposed pregnancies do we feel is sufficient for a given <clears throat> outcome to then start moving towards looking at an association, looking at causal inference. Accepting that initially it's gonna be with relatively limited confounding control. As we have more exposed pregnancies, we can become more um, strict in terms of adjustment for confounding. Similar for some of the um, approaches that were discussed this morning when we're using more of a scanning approach to sort of try and detect signals, 
we know from the simulation studies that have been done that we really read a large amount number of, of exposed women, like often in the thousands, like not a single drug is going to have that many exposed pregnancies initially. So what is the time point? Can we pre-specify how many exposed pregnancies that we need before we start using these um, approaches? And perhaps if we can sort of focus on these dynamic decision criteria that we can start generating the evidence as the, accum as the information accumulates over time, as it accumulates in real time while capitalizing on the strength of each of these different approaches. So I'm going to leave it here for my opening right. remarks. Thank you, Krista. And finally, we have Janet Hardy, who is currently an independent consultant but has extensive experience in academia, government, and industry as a perinatal pharmacoepidemiologist, including serving as executive director and head of pharmacoepidemiology at Biohaven Pharmaceuticals and Pfizer. Janet. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. I'm deeply grateful for the invitation to join this, um, this panel and to be part of this important workshop. Um, and I just want to say that my opinion, these, my statements reflect my own opinions. And I appreciate the effort that's gone into organizing this workshop and to the efforts that the FDA has put into analyzing the data that was presented to us and developing this important framework. We do need to advance this this area, and so efforts to put together a framework are, are really valuable. Um, I'm in agreement fully with everything that's been said so far. I, I can't dispute any of that. I'm a firm believer in the contribution of multiple study types in contributing to a body of evidence, and registries and databases are complementary of each other. I can't emphasize that enough, as my colleagues have already. And I also want to address the um, presentations so far that have today that have focused on databases because we do have an enormous amount of information that come from databases, whether it's individually, um, Sentinel, they too have their limitations. And I, I, I want to emphasize the importance of using them for the right question. They can be incredibly strong and helpful with the right type of question. It's not just a blanket um, uh, study question that can be addressed and, and have them be relevant. So I think it's, it's really right question, right study, and complementary studies. And so addressing their, some of their limitations, I, I want to backtrack and say, that in recent years, recent decades, so much effort and progress has been made in developing very elegant an an algorithms and analytic strategies to use databases. However, as already indicated, they are still limited, limited by the data that goes into them and the data that is missing. And some of that missing data reflects our um, underserved and minority communities, and that should be recognized. So. Mm -hmm using, a, a thinking of the study question that best address their strengths is important. I also want to just make a point about looking at databases and expecting prevalence of exposure to pop up as being um, very meaningful. The FDA sends PMRs and PMCs with, that are based by indication. And that's how we define our, our groups, our cohorts, by exposed and unexposed. And I think it's important to recognize that depending on the indication, so going back to, again, the question that is asked, not every prenatal visit and not every historical visit in the pregnant person's record has a checkmark encoded visit for that indication. So you may not be able to identify your populations that are truly representative of prevalence. It's not that easy. So it may also indicate that there are not that many people in the database that you're going to find. And that's one of the points that, that is worth um, noting. So it may not reflect all of your exposed people. Um, I, I also think that it's very important to ask the right question of databases based on the type of exposure you have. So um, these are oversimplified, but I think they are are relevant examples. I think we also have a limited amount of, a limited type of outcome that can be asked of these databases that has also been um, mentioned. Something that hasn't been mentioned but was addressed in the presentations was the value of chart review to validate outcome studies. 
it is very true that these are a valuable tool. But in practice, let's not forget that chart reviews can be requested. We don't, it's not often that you see 100% requests come back and that you get all the information that you want. In fact, many times, the yield can be quite low and at tremendous cost. So what you have in terms of generalizability is worth reflecting on. Um, next point, single outcome studies. I think some of my colleagues already know my feelings about this. It was mentioned earlier. Um, I, I would like to see further rationale for this being part of the framework. Um, as it currently stands, I believe this strategy may be taking us a little bit backwards in time. And I'm concerned about focusing on a finding from a single source, if that's where it's coming from, perhaps such as an animal study, if I understood correctly. We know that animal models may not always represent um, the humans. But if we are to focus on a single outcome study, I'm concerned about loss of precious time and, and having a broader array of outcomes, uh, having them staggered in time if need be. Because our, we rarely conduct um, clinical trials pre-approval for invo involving pregnant patients. And isn't there a purpose still? Active surveillance, in fact, enhanced active surveillance which leads me to want to refocus us on the important questions of the patient. A person who becomes pregnant is generally, or contemplating pregnancy, is generally wanting to know, is this drug, molecular vaccine, going to be safe to take in pregnancy? They're going to be really interested if you have a piece of information that says, well, this drug caused, for example, oral facial clefts. That's really nice to know but I think they're really interested in the broad array of outcomes. And so keeping that in mind when you're looking at a reduced or limited or even single outcome. And I do have an alternative proposition for consideration, and that is to look at innovative and efficient methodology that maximizes what our current understanding of complementary studies are including the use of digital technologies and have our registries and databases be more inclusive of underserved populations. Let's reach out to them and be better at what we're doing right now. Have them support each other in terms of validation. And importantly, as been mentioned already for the, the um, proposed studies, but in our existing studies have built in milestones that include a feasibility assessment at let's say year three, and, and several years there later, thereafter, having agreements with the FDA to say, if we're not meeting our targets, let's stop, have a discussion, and say, either we re-strategize or refocus our target, and uh, look again in the next couple of years or three years, and if it's not working, there needs to be an agreement to either have a decision made or have some stopping rules. And um, lastly, I want to make a proposal, since we're talking about adding PK studies, I think it would be appropriate to, to ask for the world and think about um, going beyond PDUFA and, and including generics in some of our studies. Those are women get um, pregnant people, the um, experience pregnancies on generics as well, and those would enhance sample size and the ability to study. So those should be considered. I'll turn it back to general discussion. Thank you, Janet. Um, and now we have Lin Yao, who's the director of the Division of Pediatric and Maternal Health of the Office of New Drugs at FDA, and Bob Ball, who's the deputy director of the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology. And Lin and Bob, I don't know if you want to comment on some of the things you've heard just now, things broader from the past couple of days. Uh, so I, I have uh, one question that I would like to ask the panelists. Um, um, Picking up on uh, a point that Dr. Hardy just made about using um, electronic healthcare databases uh, in a focused way. Um, because um, it, it, one of the, uh, you know, we've heard very broadly about all the many issues that are, uh, that um, 
uh, are involved in uh, ass assessing and, and using um, drug safety information in pregnancy. Um, and um, you heard from uh, Dr. Mara this morning about the, the Sentinel program and um, uh, from Dr. Bright before about the ARIA uh, program. And um, so one of our, um, you know, somewhat narrow questions in the context of all this other uh, large, uh, large issues is how do we optimize the use of the ARIA system um, for pregnancy safety assessment? And um, so um, I think you heard from uh, Dr. Wah yesterday um, uh, and, and some of the other FDA presenters that uh, the vast majority of PMRs that are issued are for signal identification. And uh, so one of the the, the, the questions we're really trying to address is, can we use um, the ARIA system and some of the tools like the tree scan methodology um, in a particular way, let's say focusing on a certain number of um, major congenital malformations uh, to um, at least contribute some useful information to this whole uh, array of questions that are in front of us. Let me go first and attempt to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I think, I mean, the data can obviously be used. I mean, if, if you're talking about, I mean, you made reference to the approach such as tree scan. I think there the, the challenge remains like the number of exposed pregnancies. If you want to avoid running an analysis and ending up with no signals that are all false negative signals because you just didn't have the power, right? So that is one thing I think we need to be very cognizant of. Like, I think traditionally we had been more focused about on false positives because there was this concern if you don't have a predefined hypothesis, you're screening across all of these potential outcomes, you're gonna have all these false positives. But I think what we've come to realize is like, it's really the false negatives that are probably more of a concern than the false positives. So that is one thing. I think we, there's definitely a minimum requirement in terms of number of exposed in order to get any useful information out of an approach like that. The other issue um, I think is important to mention is like in, in a massive data source such as like um, the Sentinel, you're basically using a lot of the information on, on, on pregnant individuals that you have available in the US. And if you're using it for signal identification or signal detection, the next step will then be signal evaluation. And one of the questions that brings up is then, what do you use for signal evaluation? Um, because you've sort of used all of your available pregnancies already. And like in the context of some of the work that we've done, which is completely outside of like the FDA work, it's like we've reached out when we did a study in the US and found a signal, reached out, for example, to our can uh, colleagues in the Scandinavian countries to see could they replicate it and do they get the same signal? Or for another study that we're actually in the midst of doing uh, right now where we're looking at um, antipsychotics, we found like a potential signal that had not um, formally been identified and we reached out to Dr. Lee Cohen to see whether in the context of the registry, perhaps they found a signal. But I think you're gonna need that complementary data source if you're using such massive data source for signal um, identification in order to confirm the signal. So I think those are two important challenges when using such an approach. Okay. Anybody else have any? Um, I did want to make sure I heard correctly. So just a question of clarification. Um, the, the framework that we proposed, I think, was intended to come up with an optimal study de design at time X, if you will. And what I'm hearing from, I think, all of you and the panel is that time X is not necessarily the optimal time. So there's the optimal study for an optimal time. And what's not included in the framework yet is this idea of, of, um, of repeating the process or at least not relying on a single time point to make a final decision about what study might be the best. Is, am, am I, I just want to make sure that I've heard that correctly. I, I would 
if I may just yeah, make a point, I would agree with you, actually. I think these are long studies. It takes a long time once the drug hits the market to penetrate. The population have us understand um, the uptake in pregnancy, and it's a dynamic process. I think that is can't be emphasized enough. So, Sonia made the point earlier, as did my other colleagues, and I think the point about putting milestones in protocols. Situations change. Other competitor drugs come on the markets. Other alternatives come out. You have to be flexible. And going in, you just never know what the uptake will be. Awesome. And, and women stop their drugs was the, was the opposing point. Sorry. Yeah, I totally agree with the dynamic um, and how the framework can have more of a uh, decision tree approach, um, including, OK, if there is signal detection and there are signals, then what? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you do afterwards? And I think under the same discussion, the decisions about safety or for the label that are made at point A might be different five years later or 10 years later. And that's OK. That's not a mistake. You, you have to do some recommendations with the information you have at, uh, at approval. And that those might be different from like five years or 10 years afterwards, not because there was an error, but because we gather more information. But what to do at each of the times, I agree, it's a dynamic process. That it would be great if you could have in the framework some allowance for that on planning up what to do if what. And, and isn't that how science evolves as more information comes along? But maybe just to clarify one point, I think a lot of these decisions or, or these criteria can be known or, or can be predefined at the start when you sort of have to make your decision. But the process itself would have to remain flexible, right? It's not that you have no idea what's going to happen in five years, and therefore you need to completely reevaluate. But you can sort of now set some criteria that you then evaluate in five years to then decide which of the two roads you'll continue on. Yeah, I agree. I think it would be really important to have this a priori set up of, of you know, milestones, but not going blind into it, really knowing where you are going and depending on what you get, adapting your framework and, flex and making it more flexible. Definitely. I'd like to follow up on the, <coughs> the point that I think has been made by all the panelists and I think throughout the two days is that where the decision involves something, many considerations other than the risk of major congenital malformations. And that you know, there are formal mathematical ways to weigh the, the trade-offs and you use them for sample size. As Krista said, you know, what's, what degree of certainty do you need to do? What kind of process should there be in, to kind of think about what those outcomes should be for a given drug or class of drug? Because who, who should be providing the input to that, to the sponsors, to FDA? Is it clinicians? Is it patients? Should there be a formal process for, for soliciting that input? And when should that occur in the, pro in the, in the approval process? Sonia? I can start the discussion. Um, I think there was a discussion for vaccines some years ago. And the guy, uh, guidelines have a minimum set, common set of outcomes that are, if you wish, the lower hanging fruit because of their significance in morbidity and mortality, like major congenital malformations to their frequency, like preterm or NICU admission. So there can be a minimum set of common uh, outcomes I will propose. And then, depending on the drug, maybe because if we are uh, aware of some toxicity or uh, physiopathologically that there is expected outcome, then at all, at um, some of additional outcomes of interest um, for each particular um, drug. And should benefit be maternal or neonatal benefit be included in that as well? Are you asking me? Well, just uh, I'm throwing that. <laughs> <laughs> I will allow my clinician uh -huh. friends to respond to that. So yes, I, th I think they should indeed. And I would say that a way to perhaps do it is to look by therapeutic areas. We have a pretty good idea by therapeutic area, by disease. And clinicians have a good idea about the natural history of the disease, of course, with the current standard of care. And so we we. We know quite a bit about these risks. 
And having that as a baseline, having that as a common way, now the whole challenge is who's doing that? And how are we going to set that up? Because I think this is not a one pharma thing. It's a, it's a whole disease area. And something we can think about then, maybe as, as, a, as an option, is to think of, of um, the equivalent of, of what Europe um, has done with IMI and a public-private partnership, where actually the companies are working with the public to make a, a consortium and have this type with pre-specified um, disease area and that are prioritized, and then starting looking consistently at that. So that could be a way to think about it. Um, but, but having them as a baseline for all therapeutic areas would maybe be a way. And we see the, the antiretroviral registry, which has a lot of information because it's done at that level. Any audience questions? <laughs> Garrett, Dr. Cohen has. Thanks. First of all, thank you for such an extraordinary uh, series of comments um, that sort of fold science into the practical uh, aspects of uh, delivering care. Um, and so, uh, I have, this is a question for anybody on the panel, and Dr. Yao, it really goes to your point about should uh, pharmacovigilance sort of be dynamic, uh, and, uh, so, and so I agree, but I, I sort of wonder, what do you do then, uh, and I, I pitched this to my, my colleagues from Boston, when you then publish in New England uh, about the relationship between lamotrigine and clefts, when you have a positive finding, how do you walk it back? when time then proves that to be, frankly, not as great a concern as you, uh, as, as was published. And, and what do patients and, and, and colleagues do? Um, and, and, and Chris, it really goes to your comment that, in a way, false negatives implies that we just haven't gone far enough sometimes because we, we're underpowered. But I worry because false, uh, sorry, false negatives uh, imply that we have to sort of move forward and get larger samples. It's false positives that ends up on CNN and petrifies patients. And so I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would pitch it to, um, to the panel. Since I think you were referring to your Boston colleague. <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> the, the Lamotrigine finding was neither us nor in the New England, but, <laughs> but it's a good point. And, and when we had then the topiamate and clefts, what, what we did was uh, um, to try to replicate it simultaneously in the registry data, in the database, and in the case control study. And it, in that occasion, it was replicated. But we find that um, we, we are in that situation, as you know, all the time. Like, what do you do when you have a few exposed and like, one or two uh, malformations that make it into a tenfold increased risk, but with huge confidence intervals? And, how to responsibly react to that. Because when you find it, you do not know if it is true or not. You know it was false only a few years later. So I think that's an important question. And even for the HIV uh, pregnancy registry that has been going on for many, many years, they publish everything every six months. So how to make it public without alarming necessarily the users? I, I think that's a great question. And, I, and I, I don't have the complete answer. I think that. We, I agree we have a responsibility of not going to CNN with the, before doing our best and, and going first to our peers, to the scientific community, um, to, to regulatory agencies, uh, um, like, hey, we, we have that, we didn't expect it, and, and try to be as responsible, responsible as possible without hiding information. So I, I think that that can be part of the framework, like when do you release data? I think that might be a, a, a good, I, I think that's a phenomenal point, and it's been a concern all of, for years and, and probably won't go away because we have greater access to information for everyone now, and access 
to information by, by people who won't necessarily understand or see or take the time to read the caveats and the confidence intervals around that piece of information and may react in fear or litigation and at the worst case the drug is litigated off the market. Um, it, it's, a, it's a tremendously challenging question and as data accrues, if you <coughs> see a, a change and, and a signal goes away, that, I mean, that would be optimal. But to when to release early information or not to release information, I don't know if there's really an early, an easy answer to that, but it's a, an important one. Krista? Question. Yes, I, I just want to make sure to clarify one point that I mentioned. Like my intention was not to give the message that if you don't pick up any signals, it must mean that you're underpowered, right? My point was like, <coughs> we know that if you're sort of scanning across like hundreds of different outcomes and you have to adjust for the multiplicity of testing, a few hundred patients, you're guaranteed not to pick up the signal. So that's sort of in that context. It's not like no signal means like you must be underpowered and you need to keep looking. That's not the message that I wanted to give. Um, and then in terms of like what you do when you have a finding and it sort of gets gets published, I mean, that's sort of what I was alluding to earlier. I think it's really important if it's like the first time that we identify this signal that we try and replicate it before it sort of goes out to the public, either in another data source of the same kind or ideally in a different type of data source, but at least one other study where you sort of see the same signal gives you some reassurance that it could still be confounding, right? It always could, but it gives you more reassurance that maybe something real is going on versus you really are dealing with like um, a random error and, and a chance finding. Um, and then in terms of like, I think, and I've had many conversations with a lot of you here, I think a, a big component that we're still dealing with is risk communication. Yesterday we had the discussion like even there's different qualities of studies that are out there and we sort of rely on the peer review process to sort of distinguish between what are good or, and what are not so great studies. But in essence, I mean, it's still the providers and the patients who sort of have to sort through all of this literature, which is often very conflicting. And I think that whole risk communication piece and how do we communicate to providers, to patients, like what is potentially a real risk versus what is just noise in the literature is an enormous um, task ahead of us. Still. But they're also focusing on absolute risk and risk differences. I think that was mentioned at some point this morning is also important to put into context any potential large relative risks that we might be seeing in an individual study. Marie? Yeah, <coughs> so my point was exactly that on risk communication. <coughs> Not only when, but how do we communicate that risk? And I think we have a tendency to really put it out very quickly because we want that to happen very dramatically because we think <coughs> it be a risk. I think every, everyone, all of us, have a different threshold for risk. And this is where the context of the need of the patients need to be considered as well. Um, and I think the, the sad part about it is that when we communicate like that without the, the context around it, Patients tend to not get into registry, not continue the treatment, which is absolutely fair, but then we have less data. So how do we validate? So it's kind of this vicious circle that we cannot get out of. So we, if it would be fantastic, of course, if we find the magic recipe to do that. Unfortunately, we leave it a little bit to the physicians and to the clinicians to have this discussion with the patients but having some rules and some, some a priori decisions on that would be really, really helpful, I think. Jean? Jean? No, Jean. Oh, I'm Glenn, I'm sorry. Janet. Oh, okay. I'm, Janet. I'm, 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 <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Janet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no problem. Sorry. Actually, um, I wanted to ask another clarifying question um, that sort of um, um, it is sort of a follow-on to, to Lee's question. It's, you know, we have talked about an optimal study, right? Um, that, you know, of the studies that are possible or feasible, what is optimal? And what I'm hearing, what I've heard from the four of you is that 
there are um, pluses and minuses, pros and cons to all of the studies we've suggested, the database and the registry, and that they should be thought of as complementary. So my question is, when you move beyond the signal detection or signal identification to the signal evaluation, it sounds like there's a need, what I heard was replication, what I heard was kind of this confirmation that almost you're going to need more than one type of one set of one confirmatory, you know, additional set of data or additional methodology to, to really understand that signal to confirm it or to evaluate it fully. Did I get that right? Is that what I'm hearing? So, yeah. I think that in general, yes, but that there might be situations where you might not need to. For example, if we go back to Talidomide, if you had this framework at that time and you start a registry, after 50 exposed, you will know that there is something going on and then you will, of course, not try to replicate that. So I, I think, but that's the exception, thankfully. Yeah. Um, so I think that in general, yes, but there may be situations where you might take a different route in, in, in the middle of the Sure, process. sure, sure. Can, can I just ask a yep. follow-up yep. to that? Um, so um, you know, one of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the shifts that, that mm -hmm. we're, we're proposing in the framework is from kind of a, um, a what I'd call it almost a shotgun approach to saying, well, let's quantitatively assess the trade-offs between quality of data <clears throat> size of data available, timeliness of likely um, uh, achieving a, um, you know, a, a com completed study. Um, and um, it seems like um, I'm hearing that um, the, the panelists don't think that that's likely to work. Um, and so some of this has to do with like, um, uh, let me just give a concrete example. Let's suppose um, you, you were able to do a, um, <clears throat> a uh, registry study, but it took um, 10 years to get an answer. But in a claims database, you could do it in seven years. But it was just a signal identification study. Um, but the registry study, because it has better data, um, would at the same time, 10 years, also be able to do an evaluation, not just a signal detection. Uh, so you could imagine that the, the next phase of the uh, claims data signal identification would be um, some kind of assessment. Maybe um, it, it could be um, in another database or in another system that would do the evaluation. And um, I guess the question is, um, you know, is that sequential approach likely to be any to be better in any circumstances than a um, the, what I would call a shotgun approach? So I, I <coughs> just wanted to make one comment in terms of like um, sort of the pros and cons of the different approaches, right? When you said like, for example, with the registry, what if you can use it for signal identification and because the quality of the data is better, then you can also go on to signal evaluation. But I think the reality is given, no matter how successful that a given registry is, if you want to go down to specific malformations, I don't know whether other than maybe the antiretroviral registry where you have sort of like all of the different drugs contributing to the same registry, you're, I'm not sure it's realistic to expect that no matter how good the data are, that you'll ever be in the situation that you'll have enough to be able to start looking at these individual malformations to give you an example. So I think that's where it's sort of like, they're not truly alternatives in the sense that maybe in that sense, like a database study can allow you to look there. You bring up like, well, can you ever go to signal evaluation there? And I think it, to a large extent, it also really depends on how is the study designed and not so much the data source itself. And I think maybe there are some places in the framework where we would benefit from a little bit more of a distinction between there's the data source with pros and cons, but then there's also the design and the analytic approach with the pros and cons. And I agree, if you're just gonna look for 
diagnostic codes, it's not going to be a very valid outcome. But if you're looking for multiple diagnostic codes on different days, some procedure codes, if you have validated in a subset of your sample those outcomes, I don't think it's necessarily the case that you can say, like, we can do signal evaluation in the context of a database. For some outcomes, yes, for others, not. The same with, like, we're now starting to focus more on also looking at non-live bird outcomes. I mean, the data are messy, and you're going to have conflicting outcomes. Sometimes you see, like, a still bird followed by a live bird three weeks later. But you can either use the data as is, and then you have bad quality data, or you can sort of look or work very carefully through some hierarchical algorithms that give you a lot more reassurance. So I really think we would benefit from distinguishing data source, both with strengths and weaknesses, mm -hmm. and design and analysis, both with strengths and weaknesses. Um, Megan. Megan first. Okay. <coughs> um, so I'm glad I'm talking right now, because actually your question sort of is related to what I was going to say. And that is, you know, now that I've been in this field and taking care of patients for 20 years, what I've seen is that medications um, sort of go through an evolution over probably a 10 to 20 year period of use in pregnancy, right? So it starts off, nobody uses any, you know, nobody purposefully uses a new medicine in pregnancy. And what you have are the a few accidental pregnancies. Um, but some of those women have been exposed to the medicine. Some of them haven't because accidental, according to the doctor, is often not accidental to the patient. And she actually knew that she was trying to get pregnant and stop the medicine. You know, so there's, so there's those sort of confusions, right? But there's initially there's very little use. Then there's sort of a accrual of some data that maybe isn't terribly worrisome, and so then maybe some people start using it, and then maybe some more start using it, and then um, and then maybe another signal comes out that is worrisome. A signal that comes out that's worrisome will cut way down, at least in my field, the use of a medication. Um, at which point, doing any kind of pregnancy registry is going to be exceptionally challenging. And so it, it, I'm a little concerned with the idea of sort of moving forward with um, you know, only database for, for a while until there's something that we need to study. Because you lose those 10 years or five years or whatever of accidental pregnancies, planned pregnancies, and you can't go back and replicate that data. Sure, you can do a database study later because they're all sort of just floating in there, but you can't really do like a, is the patient taking the drug? What week did she take the drug? Um, teratology, physical exams, that sort of thing. You can't generate that 10 years down the line. Thank you. I wanted to get back to this idea about risk communication because I think there are ways that we can really mitigate the negative effects of publications that come out with adverse effects related to exposure. And I've seen this used much more effectively, I would say, in the last five years. And that is, if a major publication comes out, there's an editorial linked to it. An example is for our JAMA Psychiatry Board, there was a recent publication of serial MRIs in children exposed to SSRIs in pregnancy. And the investigators found changes in the brain related to exposure to SSRIs, but also to depression. And what happened was there was a very good, uh, well thought out editorial published with it that ended with the comment, these findings should not change current clinical practice. And I saw the media picking up the editorial comments as well. So I think we have a responsibility to be publishing along with these kinds of papers uh, a more um, thoughtful, you know, understanding the whole picture type of response. And I think that is really uh, uh, an effective way to at least mitigate some of the difficulties. And, and to, uh, there's a follow-up question related to that, is how, how should that be communicated in the label? <laughs> I don't know if the panelists have any suggestions. Wait, somebody used it yesterday. So I'll use it again. It depends. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I was just going to say, it, it, not about the labeling per se, but FDA has um, you know, many different ways of communicating risks, um, uh, not just labeling. So uh, 
drug safety communications, dear doctor letters, there's a whole, a whole suite of, of, of uh, tools. And I think um, uh, one of the things that FDA typically does um, when there's a signal uh, that's of concern, uh, uh, it, uh, but there hasn't been time to fully evaluate it, is looks through all the available evidence at that moment and then a kind of assembles one of these communications, whatever, you know, targets it to the public but also to professional societies, whatever the most appropriate thing is. So um, I think the FDA does have a very robust risk communication strategy in, in this light, but um, uh, there does need to be a, a broader uh, uh, approach to communicating these kinds of risks. Can I also say that um, we will, and I think it's been mentioned by Layla yesterday, we will get on the phone with our colleagues, you know, uh, internationally through the cluster to, to ask what they've seen, what they've heard. I think that's a really important point, that we want to make sure that we've checked it out with our regulatory colleagues uh, around the globe, and then also um, consider what effect that kind of communication would have, not just you know in the U.S. but but um, in other parts of the world too. So we we would definitely talk to our colleagues too as part of trying to figure out what the communication should be. Hi there, everyone. Jessica Alban, I'll see health. Um, love the uh, the attention that the APR is, is getting. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I do want to just, you know, add on to, to something I, I spoke about yesterday and just kind of bring it, uh, you know, to the attention again. But the, the importance of the advisory committee um, is really important and it can help with this, you know, kind of communication and determining of, of you know risk and, and how and when to to report things, um, you know we've got a, a, a fabulous advisory committee that includes members from CDC, NIH, FDA, as well as practicing physicians um, who are both reporting and not reporting to um, the registry. So they're they're on the ground. They're they're ones counseling the patients and have a a wealth of of you know information um, and experiences that they can relay. And um, we also have a patient advocate who can ask the question of. How do we communicate this? Like, if I'm sitting with a patient in, you know, lay language, I need you to distill this down to me in a way that I can communicate it, so that we can think through those things. Um, and you know, whether it's a registry or a database, um, that's really an invaluable um, perspective um, to have those multiple um, kind of you know viewpoints, um, giving input and direction. Um, because certainly, you know, as the uh, as the investigators, the operational side, you know, that's not our place. Um, and it's not just, you know, the place of, you know, the sponsoring companies either. Um, they, they really do need that, that direction and input. Thank you. Um, Sarah Efros, Cineos Health. I think that the discussion that's being had now about um, sequential versus parallel approaches is really important because I think we've made really good strides over the last couple of decades of, from going, of going from a sequential um, framework where there was a pregnancy registry with a potential signal, then we looked at databases, then if the, the potential signal held in the database, then we went to a case control approach. And I think that only elongated the time to either um, support or refute the original signal that was the potential signal that was identified in the pregnancy registry. So I think if the, I think what whatever the eventual framework is, it's at least to my mind going to need to allow for um, in parallel evaluation, recognizing the strengths and limitations of each of these kinds of studies, rather than maybe taking us backwards to a more um, sequential process. But as we've are, we've heard, and so many of us in this room know, it it depends. So there needs to be flexibility, because. Um, at least the ones that I've seen, none of, none of these could necessarily, none of these questions could necessarily follow a predefined, predetermined, um, non-question dependent um, approach. Thank you. Can, can I just ask a, a question, which is somewhat in follow-up to that? Um, 
So um, the, uh, yesterday there was some discussion of a national registry. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, there, there's um, many different sources of data. So there's Sentinel, there's BATS just within FDA. The CDC has its systems. Um, the, the, the data holders themselves can, you know, do their own studies or uh, companies or others can use, use those data sources. But one of the questions that um, keeps coming up, not just in, in, in pregnancy safety, but it's, it feels like very particular here, is what does the ideal like, system look like and how, um, how do we all make it sustainable? Um, so it's not just uh, like a piecemeal, FDA does a PMR, um, you know, a company does a database study, FDA does something, in ARIA. How, how do we build that sustainable system that, that, that combines claims, EHRs, registries, uh, pharmacovigilance, all these different um, data sources? So we <coughs> if we can dream, dream. like if, if we could connect everybody, and that mean if we didn't have confidentiality uh, issues, that would be uh, ideal because uh, we could identify the, the exposed, but then help the follow up by linking them with electronic health records and, and claims at the same time. I don't think that's possible right now, but if you ask what would be the ideal situation, it would be to combine all of the above. So, so just so you're, you think that the biggest barrier right now is, is just the the privacy and exchange of information across systems. Well, I, I would not call privacy a, a, a bar yeah. here, but because we have to care about it, mm -hmm. that will not allow linking and therefore improving the quality of the claims, but also expanding the identification of exposed and the, exp the follow-up of those that enroll in registries. So if, if all the systems could communicate um, I think that that would be that would facilitate our lives for any of the studies. Janet, I think that there's two types of of studies actually that you're talking about having everybody involved in one database and one registry. Did I did I catch that? Uh, I was actually com even linking those two ideal studies. Mm. Okay, so so in any case, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think uh, it also needs some um, agreement and interest from sponsors because they are the developers of our therapeutics and it takes a common protocol in many cases and um, we have very motivated sponsors and we have also a recognition that this takes money and I think that comes back to the FDA to have the regulatory authority to be asking for these types of studies. It, it, the cogs of the wheel move slowly, but there's multiple parties to move forward with this type of structure. How big a challenge is variability in how things are coded or if we're using EHR, how they're docu documented? I mean, is, is, there some, is there some additional work besides just you know, if you if you could just link everything electronically, mm. how how similar is the data set from the Mayo Clinic versus Kaiser versus some of these other ones? Is would there be some additional work in terms of consensus on common data elements, common definitions, and so forth that would have to be done? Sure, sure. Uh, like like Sentinel, for example, has this common uh, data model. So, um, and again, like. That's a pie in the sky. I, I was dreaming of doing, I'm not saying that that can be done tomorrow, but ideally, if everybody was under the same kind of health care structure, electronic health record database, and that could be uh, linked somehow to the, like to do like nested, if you wish, nested pregnancy registries or the other way around. Um, I think then the, the two main designs or data sources that we discussed, they could reinforce each other. Uh, to the point of being one, if you wish, uh, at the end. And yeah, it will require some data. 
interesting. And, and while, I mean, I, I won't argue that standardization is not good, but I think sometimes you can benefit from having the differences between the different systems, right? If one sort of has better capture of some kind of information, even though it's sort of only a smaller subset of patients that you have, maybe you can test some of your assumptions or your concerns in the main data in the smaller subset. I mean, sometimes we do studies where we link a subset to the electronic medical record system, like in the local Boston hospitals then, but at least to try and get a better sense, like we're concerned about confounding by X, like is it confirmed in this mm. subset or not? So I think sometimes standardization is good, but sometimes we can take advantage of potential differences in terms of richness of information and, and differences in coding. Right. Hi, this is Amy Ramanathan, FDA. A uh, quick question from virtual attendee, and I think it's a good question directed towards our non-FDA panelists. What do you think about communicating in equivocal information and drug labeling? If some data suggest risks and some do not, and a causal association is unclear, should we put that in labeling or wait? I think there's a lot of people listening that would be interested in that response. That's risky now to say something. <laughs> As a non-FDA, non-regulatory person. Um, I wonder whether there is information. In, I mean, there's a difference between absence of any evidence versus there is some evidence, and it's clearly not pointing towards like a strong risk site. So I'm not sure like being very ambivalent to say some yes, some no, we really don't know. But like providing some information that yes, there some studies have been done and at least no clear, very strong risks have been um, identified, maybe more modest increases can be excluded. It seems to me that for providers and for patients that there is value in that information. How exactly to frame it, that's a different point. But I think even if the information is more ambivalent, it, I do think there seems to be value in it. Would it be worthwhile in bringing back that it depends? Um, yeah. But also the um, not I, I thoroughly agree with what you've just said. But also the the number of studies that are contributing to that ambivalence and and quality studies I think also bears in uh, keeping in mind. But Lynn, share with us. Correct me if I'm wrong. With the, with uh, following you know the establishment of the PLLR, we have a precedent because there are many labels that include language which highlights uh, you know, the fact that there may be data uh, pointing in one direction and other data uh, that didn't support that. And so that already exists. Um, I think it's a fantastic question from whoever shared that virtually uh, because that's reality. And I think sharing uh, that ambiguity with our colleagues or providers is a good thing uh, that, that, we, that the answer may not be uh, you know, uh, nailed down at that exact uh, moment. So. So I think it's actually it's a it's a wise thing, Dr. Ball. I think your your point was just so critical. Um, I think the greatest challenge is firewalls. Uh, the fire and, and when folks have tried to do what you just were describing, um, uh, managing firewalls can be very challenging. And and actually, uh, when those firewalls are removed, we <laughs> we pitch it to very seasoned data managers um, to frankly na uh, navigate the very real issues of of compatibility of different uh, data sources. But those have sort of been managed more than sometimes the amount of time that goes by while uh, we're trying to navigate uh, agreements and firewalls between uh, people, uh, various stakeholders in the space. Hi, I'm Elsie Grace from Eli Lilly again. Um, I have a question about this idea of taking a sequential approach. And I've been wondering how we might think about this within the context of a specific study design. So for example, a registry. Um, if you think about, I assume this is how everyone does it, but we develop a full protocol where we talk about we're going to do these propensity score mass methods. and. And we put a lot of resources into developing these really big, thorough protocols when we have no idea kind of what, what the uptake will be like. And also, I also, um, I'm wondering um, about the idea of can we consider when it might make sense to enroll a, a comparator group? Because I know, for example, 
um, we want to be careful about temporality and, and when one group is studied versus another. But um, maybe especially from a physician or patient, does a woman participating in a registry as a comparator, and if that registry never reaches a specific number to be able to do those comparisons, are we using those patients' time well? Are we using the physician's resources well? So I just wanted to think about the idea of not even between studies and having a sequential approach, but even within a study design, does it make sense for us to think about what an appropriate sequential approach might be? And that might end up that, you know, there's there's protocol version A and SAT version A, and then depending on what happens, like maybe there's another iteration. So just wanted to bring that up for discussion. Sonia? Yeah, I think that's what we refer we, we were referring to with the dynamic adaptable framework that will have milestones and checks every year, every half a year to revisit um, even the statistical uh, protocol, as you said, no, I agree with you. Like you have five, and you have to develop your propensity scores. Like, okay, um, yeah. So I totally agree with having that in place within the framework as uh, in a, a, a life system with a, a priori rule, mm. but that have that flexibility at certain points. I, I think, though, that to begin with. The, the, there should be a robust full protocol assuming that we can move forward mm -hmm. and then hitting milestones we're probably if it's not working we're going to peel off and say no well, we can't do this but to revise and add things to the protocol as you go along is then you're I, I, I like the idea of starting with a full protocol and then saying okay this isn't going to happen and uh, as we reach our our, our milestone. Okay. Yes. That would be my preference. Uh, to uh, an interesting thought about, I, I appreciate your, your thoughts on whether we're using comparators time and HCPs time well. What came to mind um, for me was clinical trials. Um, we have control groups in clinical trials. Not everything works out. And sometimes trials are stopped. Sometimes um, they simply, they're ineffective and, and everything stops. Do we ask the same question at that time of the comparators? I, is there, is there? Yeah, but there's. They're, they're still um, agreeing to participate in a study and provide their time and information at the beginning. I think it, it, the beginning of the intent is, is helpful and that it will move forward. I don't know, that's just a personal opinion on the fly. I think we're going to need to stop because it's, unfortunately this is a, a great discussion. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists and the FDA representatives. Um, and I know, I, I'm sure Garrett is going to, again, encourage everyone to submit questions to the docket um, and to continue the conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Before um brief closing remarks, and yes, thank you, Evan. One final reminder. Um, sincere thanks to the, to the virtual participants. We're grateful um, where we've been able to incorporate your suggestions live. Um, but know also that all submitted questions are forwarded to the FDA for their review and consideration. They are sincerely grateful, and this will contribute to uh, consideration for framework revisions. Thanks also to all of our participants who contributed today. Um, one thing that's that stood out throughout, um, folks that have contributed, you've devoted your careers to these issues. Uh, the wisdom that you bring is evident, and it also highlights how incredibly challenging, um, how extraordinary some of these challenges are. So thank you for your career efforts, and please do continue them. Yesterday, we heard from diverse stakeholders representing patients, researchers, providers, industry, and others. 
on important considerations on the proposed pregnancy safety framework and also associated pharmacological cha challenges and decision making during pregnancy generally. <coughs> Topics are highly complex, obviously, requiring cross-sector collaboration to answer questions about the safety of pharmaceuticals during pregnancy. We also heard a lot about the need for multi-sourcing of data when possible. The FDA developed their framework with all of, the, with all of this in mind in effort to optimize study design data, study design and data, ultimately translating it into real world clinical practice. Today, we heard about upcoming demonstration projects and how they will inform the proposed framework, as well as inform us on what, uh, in, in what context a, a registry study, database study, both additional sources also, should be required at time of approval. Themes on key factors contributing to the accuracy and timeliness of pregnancy safety data included exposure and outcome sensitivity and specificity, as well as gaps the FDA is looking to fill via the demonstration projects. Also anticipation of gaps that will still remain. Our last, uh, additionally capturing targeted outcomes and considering data beyond claims were discussed multiple times. Our last session of the day concluded with a robust discussion on the application of the framework and provided a range of recommendations for consideration in the future development of the framework presented in this public workshop. So many great inputs and dialogue involved from all in that session. Thank you so much for wrapping the day with such candor and thoughtfulness. For Evan's reminder, We'd like to remind audience members this is the first iteration of FDA's draft framework. Further work will occur via those demonstration projects just referenced, leading to an updated framework. The community's inputs and insights are highly encouraged, necessary, and welcomed. Please do so by the end of November 30th, if submitting to the public <laughs> docket. You'll find that docket via the Federal Register Notice of this public workshop. Again, all of this material slides, presentations, agenda, et cetera, will post in just a matter of days. Before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone involved in putting together this excellent event. First of all, and in a recurring fashion, our speakers and panelists, moderators, et cetera, um, very grateful. So months of work that led into it, sometimes years, grateful for that too. Also like to thank specifically our colleagues on the FDA planning team, including Vicki Chan, Amy Ramanadan, Wei Hua, Leila Sahin, Lin Yao, and many, many more. Both your presentations today and all the work leading up to it are, we really are quite grateful for it. And of course, I always like to do this last. The great team here at Duke, um, our moderators, Megan Close, Gita Swamy, Evan Myers, Marianne Hamilton Lopez, and also our project staff, including Marianne Naffey, Duray Kim, Hannah Vitello, Luke Durasher, Nancy <coughs> Allen Lapointe, and Kate Sandulas. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, thank you to everybody who attended in person, echoing what so many other people said. <sighs> Delightful to see you. This is my first in person in almost four years. Probably done, <laughs> probably done a couple dozen prior to that. Um, meant a lot to me. Saw a lot of old friends too. With that. Have a good afternoon. Hope to catch you all again soon.